for service and for communion. Okay, so the, this morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 16. This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 16. And the last time the message was titled, Entropy Temporarily Reversed. We had a lot of fun with that. Entropy is a scientific term. It can be applied to a lot of the sciences. This time I applied, applied entropy to the spiritual realm. You know, if things go from order to disorder to chaos, etc. And ever since sin entered the world, that's really what's been happening in the world, right? We die, we pass away, our bodies decay. And, you know, in your 20s and 30s, you might not feel it, but later on, you will start to feel it, trust me. So, uh, so that, that happens, um, there's your positive message for the morning. And uh, also, there's a spiritual entropy, which really, uh, you know, the, the natural man, the natural woman without God, without the Spirit of God indwelling in them, unfortunately moves towards this situation in death where they unfortunately face judgment. So Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He did a lot of really neat stuff. But in the message that I taught, it was kind of neat because there was a person who was dying. He reversed that. And there was a person who had died, which was unique to Luke's gospel, that he raised from the dead. So you can see this entropy temporarily reversed. Now, where we are today, if you have trusted in Christ, well, he's helped you with that spiritual entropy, right? You are promised eternal life, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, and the Lord will come another time, he told us, to redeem and reverse the entropy of the physical creation. So we suffer hurricanes and floods and you know, earthquakes and all that kind of stuff, but that's not going to exist either. So Jesus came the first time to redeem spiritual part of of human nature, which is the most important, where we spend eternity, and the second time he's going to come to remake everything physical, to make it beautiful like it was in the beginning. Today's message is titled, Struggling with God's Will. Ooh, struggling with God's will. If you're watching on the live stream or you're here physically today, this is definitely a message that will touch everybody because if we're honest with ourselves, I'll be the first one to raise my hand, we sometimes struggle with God's will. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so we're looking at John the Baptist. We're going to see a profile of his character, the historical figure, how he struggled with God's will. But we can also make application in our own lives. And it doesn't mean that we're evil or it's a terrible thing. What it does mean is that we're not perfected on this side of eternity. So, you know, before being saved, we just had a fleshly nature. And we just did things that, you know, comforted the flesh. But when we're born again of the Spirit of God, now we have another nature. Hopefully that has dominance in our life, that spiritual nature, but unfortunately we're still tied to the flesh. So there's going to be times that solid people, solid Christians are going to struggle with God's will. And I'm actually going to bring up a person from history and I'm um, going to have a little interesting discussion about that, somebody who's a real hero of faith and uh, also struggled with God's will, according to those that, that worked with her extensively. And we are going to look at this in three parts. So jumping in in verse 16, it said, now remember the, in context, the widow's son was raised from the dead, right? We covered that the last time. Then fear and respect came upon all and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and the surrounding region. Then the disciples of John reported, so this would be John the Baptist, to him recording concerning all these things. So John's in a Herodian prison and his disciples are still out there doing things. And apparently there is some visitation so they're able to report to John what the Messiah who he introduced is actually doing out there. And then John sends his disciples to Jesus to ask him a question. Very powerful question. It says, And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour, 
He, Jesus, cured many people of their infirmities, their illnesses, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many who were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So one out of three is John's struggle with God's will. Two things are happening at the same time. Number one, John the Baptist is in prison, wondering, you know, in prison, you're confined, you're probably very boring. John is an outdoorsman. He grew up in the wilderness. He's probably really not happy about being confined in this prison. And he's wondering if Jesus is the Christ. At the same time, Jesus was doing things that only the Christ can do according to prophecy. So it's very interesting that these two things are happening at the same time. Why would John ask this question? Here, let me paint myself more into a corner here. Let's go to John 1. Now this is John, the disciple, writing what he saw in his interaction between John the Baptist and Jesus. So let's look at that, and we'll talk about it. So John 1, verse 29 says, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he, look at the detail in this, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit, right, the Spirit of God, descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him, upon Jesus. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So is this the same person who's having a crisis of faith? It sure is. Do you think the fact that he was rotting in a Herodian prison had something to do with it? What does this mean? You know, the, the person who wants to criticize the Bible will say, well, there's an inconsistency there. It doesn't make any sense. But the beauty of the Bible is that it's real. It reflects the lives of real people, real human beings like you and me, who struggled who had a crisis of faith at time. So to me, that's even more beautiful. Do, do we ever say one thing and then a few days later or a month later do something else? We've all done that, haven't we? Right? It means that John was human. It means that John had highs and lows like all of us. Have we been there? Well, I'm sure none of us have been in a Herodian prison, uh, but have we been there with those highs and lows? Sometimes extreme trials can cause us to question God. Who hasn't done that? Now, there's a caveat here. It doesn't mean that we disbelieve in Him. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that when we're having a bad month or a bad year, we go, oh, I don't believe in God anymore. Of course you do. People who say that are usually upset with God, of course they believe. But it's a frustration that they have, that they express. Today, this is, this is just one of those sermons that are just, it's, like totally real. We're going there. There's a lot to unpack here. The human condition comes in different forms, these trials. It could be an untimely death of a loved one. It could be someone who's been a victim of a crime, financial peril, or a diagnosis of a disease. We equate our sufferings with God forgetting about us or not fulfilling his end of the bargain. That's why it is so important for churches to teach the Bible. And a lot of churches don't teach the Bible. So when their followers or their congregates go through tough times, they don't have anything to fall on because they haven't been taught, they haven't been encouraged to read. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation, you'll have trial, you're going to have problems. But be of good cheer, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Now, we, we're not seeing that part yet of him overcoming the world. That is a future occurrence, but we have the hope that he, he's so far fulfilled all of his promises, you know, some of them just aren't taking place right now, but they will be. Did John misunderstand the aspect of ministry, right? His question about not conquering Rome, 
You know, John's sitting in prison probably every day, any day now, there's going to be a prison break, right? Jesus is going to come and melt the bars and I'm going to get out and I'm going to be his general. You know, where's the prison break? Days, hours turn into days, days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months. And John's struggling. However, some of the greatest believers struggled with their roles. And you in your life, in your spiritual gifts, may also struggle with your role. But be of good cheer. Wait till you see what Jesus says about John. He makes sure he reassures the people that John was a, he's a great servant of the living God. Right? It's right in here. Maybe John thought, how can I truly have a role in God's economy in this messiahship if I'm stuck in prison? Hebrews 11, the heroes of faith. Some of those heroes died a martyr's death. Do you realize that? And God says that they're heroes. Some were victorious, but some died. Painful deaths. However, they're all in the same place now. Right? They're all equal. That's a beautiful thing. I want to digress for a moment. Uh, My wife and I... watching a a, a movie about Harriet Tubman, right? The Underground Railroad, freeing the slaves, taking them to the north. And uh, the movie was captivating. We caught it mostly in the beginning and, and, you know, I'm like, oh, I think I know who this is, you know? (laughs) So, but you, as usual, the movies embellish. So now as we're watching, I'm going on the computer I know something about Harriet Tubman, but I wanted to know more. And the truth is, the movie was actually pretty accurate. Harriet Tubman, um, she escaped to the North, and she found an organization, you know, the the Underground Railroad, you know, different people um, made tunnels, they sent parties out to free the slaves and stuff. And this, this is an amazing thing about this woman. You would see her in the movie, she'd be just dropping down at some point and just praying. And everybody would just leave her alone (laughs) because they knew that she was amazing. She'd have these people with her and they're like, we got to get out of here. And she'd stop in the middle of the forest and just pray for as long as it took. And they left her alone because they knew there was one time that um, she had to go a different route because God was basically telling her there's danger over in this side. So I was totally captivated by the movie and one of the things that struck me was she goes back for her husband. And this is a true story. John, by the time she gets back to John, who's still in captivity, right, she sneaks in to see him and he goes, I've taken another wife. And she felt so betrayed and she started to say, Lord, why? Like she was crushed by this. You know, we don't always see the end of the story. God, she, she was right. She was credited to uh, freeing close to a thousand people just on her own, and there were several thousand freed by the network of the organization. But she was, they called her the Moses, uh, you know, the, whatever. The, the, that was her nickname, Moses. But she had an idea of what God was trying to do, and it came with a lot of sorrow and heartbreak because some of her relatives didn't want to go be freed either. If you, those of you who know the story and the history, and it, it crushed her to the core because these are personal relationships. But those people made those decisions. It was their free will, but he still wanted her to go and free these people. So she had to work with, with what was God's will. Yes, he did want her to go back, but not necessarily in the way that she thought. And he used her in a mighty way. And even though that broke her heart, she just kept going back and forth, back and forth. So, uh, yeah, I learned something about it in school, and then I'm like, I do this a lot. We'll watch some, something historical, and Heather's like, what are you doing? Who are you texting? I'm like, I'm looking through, you know, I'm looking through the sources to find out if this is true because it was a fascinating story. Hey, the, the best people, the best Christians have struggled with God's will. I just want to encourage you with that. I don't care if you're 14 years old. I don't care if you're 94 years old. Um, we are not perfected here. Can I just be honest with you? I struggle with God's will sometimes. It's like, I'm one of those very organized people. I want to see the start to the finish, and he always gets me with that. And it's like he's saying to me, Joe, it's not how I work. You know, you're going to know a good portion of it to do my will, but I'm not going to dot across every T and dot every I. You're just going to have to go in faith. And I learned that lesson a lot. 
So I just want to encourage you with that. A lot of you are going to be happy that you came here this morning because there's somebody here or there's a, a group of people here who are struggling. You believe in God, you believe, you've trusted in Christ, and right now, man, you're having a hard time. Months, years. It's one thing to have a bad day, but to have a bad year or a bad couple of years, let this encourage you. How long was John in prison? I have no idea. But it was totally different than what he was used to. Verse 21 is so cool. It's kind of cool how God, even when we pray, how he answers our questions. He doesn't always answer it with uh, this straight, you know, perfectly manicured answer that we're looking for. But it said in verse 21, at that very hour. So that sort of was the answer, that Jesus did all these incredible things. And sometimes God says to us, look at the big picture. Sometimes we're just one of the pixels, right, in the big picture. And there could be millions of pixels that make the picture. And we're important, but we're just one of the pixels, you know. And he's saying, look at the big picture here. Verse 22, again, Jesus even verbally doesn't directly answer their question. What he does is he answers their question with Scripture. Are you the coming one or should we look for another? The blind see, the mute speak, the dead are raised, the sick are healed, right? And what was Jesus doing? He was really quoting or expressing Isaiah 61. We've been over that scripture many times, right? He had spoke about what the Messiah would do and the incredible things that would happen in the first century. And answering with scripture is the best answer. And I got to tell you personally, <laughs> When I go through things, I have to fall back on Scripture. Because if I let my feelings and emotions get the best of me, I'm not going to be in a good place. <laughs> so, um, woe is me, or anger, or whatever. It's just not going anywhere good. So I'm like, all right, well, what does the Bible say? <laughs> and, and that is the beauty of coming somewhere where you're actually taught the Scripture. Go to God's Word. It's never going to steer you wrong. Verse 23, it says that, so he says a few interesting things here. He says that, and blessed is he who's not offended because of me or not caused to stumble because of me. That word in the Greek is scandalizo. What word do we get in the English? Scandal, right? A scandalizo in the Greek, in Greco-Roman culture, was basically, it was a bird trap. If the bird was unwitting and went into this thing, it would trap them. And that's how human beings were able to trap birds. So this scandalizo, blessed is he who is not offended by me. Blessed is he who is not scandalized by me or not trapped or ensnared from pulling away from me. Because, listen, John, he, he died a hero of faith, okay? John the Baptist, no doubt. But Jesus was also making clear to his disciples, you're not always going to get the answer that you're looking for. It's not always going to turn out the way you want to turn out. But don't be trapped, an eternity trap, into walking away. And Jesus, as God the Son, said, I have the keys, I've got the keys to eternity. I'm the way to eternal life. I don't, know, I don't know how much time I should spend on this, but every once in a while, maybe once a year, once every two years, there's a, this is why I don't like celebrity ministries. I, they just annoy me. I think they're very shallow. Is that everyone, so there was, I forget the guy's name. He was a Christian author and he got involved with something he shouldn't have and he called all the media together, famous Christian author, and he goes, I'm not a Christian anymore because you didn't get your way. A worship leader, a famous worship person, I have all the names. I got the articles in my office. They make like a six-year-old argument. God didn't do something for me. It didn't turn out the way I wanted to. So guess what? I'm not a Christian anymore. You disbelieve in somebody you walked with for how many years? It's weak. So, but not John. <laughs> he, he didn't fall into that trap and don't fall into that trap. Remember, John struggled, but he went to distance. You know what he could have said? He could have said to Herod, if you let me go, I have such a hankering to be in the outdoors again. I'll stop preaching, I promise. I won't give you any more trouble. He could have done that and probably would have been released. But he didn't. He ran the race to the end. And I'll just leave you with this. Have you ever been confused by God's plan? Have you ever said in your prayer life or even thought to yourself, to the Lord, why don't you do something? 
Why is this happening? How come my prayers aren't being answered? And again, it just means that you're normal. It's because we're not perfected here. And, and the sad thing is there are plenty of ministries, unfortunately, that you can listen to where it's almost, they can't, and I tell you what, some, some Christian books, I've been to Christian bookstores and I looked at some of the books and I'm like, why are you selling this? It, it's garbage. Some of these authors, man, it confuses people more than it helps them. You know, you read some of these books and they tell you that they have a formula for you to get with God and almost manipulate him by way of a mantra to getting your will done. Oh, you got to get that big promotion. Maybe the big promotion is not good for you. I know people who have gotten the job of their dreams and walked away from the church, walked away from the Lord. So it, money, power, prestige, I ran into that. I, I toward at the end towards retirement, I, I thought, well, you could help me in my pension and stuff. And God just, I could see him smiling going, nope, <laughs> not happening. <laughs> and it didn't happen. So you, you, people have all these ideas. You know, I want the mansion on the cul-de-sac. You know, just keep repeating this prayer and God's going to give you it. It's like we're like spoiled king's kids now. Instead of, instead of us trying to decipher what his will is for our life, we want to tell him what we want his will because of what we want for our life. It doesn't work that way. He's God. I'm not going to sit there and put out my resume for his position. I know who he is. But a lot of people act like this is something that they want to do. Right? We have to discern what his will is for our life. Verse 24, continuing on, it says, When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. So Jesus doesn't drop it, but it's a good thing because there's an encouragement here. He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? Meaning, John, John started in the wilderness, and they went out, and he was fiery, and he was unabashed, and he was not uh, you know, intimidated by the politicians and the soldiers and the religious leaders. But it became a little bit of a spectacle to some of the people, it's sort of like what Jesus did, right? Not everybody comes to Jesus for the right reasons. Some come because of a curiosity or a fickleness. This is interesting, right? But why? He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. John the Baptist could have changed his behavior, turned away from God, said to Herod, listen, let me be your prophet. And this happened. You see, you saw it in Israel. You saw it in Roman times. You tell the people in power what they, it happens today. You tell them what they want to hear instead of the truth, and they'll set you up. Man, there's a lot of Christian ministries, a lot of Christian uh, personalities who do this, and they're well taken care of because they've turned, and they justify what they're doing. They're in king's courts, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. So this was written about John the Baptist before he was even born. Malachi 3.1, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Jesus says, For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. So two out of three is the Lord's response really to the struggle or to John's struggle. He was, maybe for some reading this, after this crisis of faith by John, the Lord was surprisingly gracious, and he also is gracious with us. He understands that we fail and we falter at times. Doesn't that encourage you? Doesn't it encourage you that that could have been taken as an, in, as an insult? Jesus, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? You're not moving fast enough, you know? This isn't kind of what I envisioned when I read the Old Testament. And then they, they go away, and he says to all the people who saw the exchange, let me tell you about John. He's got my backing. And, and that's really cool. He still spoke lovingly about John, even in his greatest failure of faith. And that failure didn't define John's entire ministry in his life. 
And brothers and sisters, your failure, your crisis of faith, your difficulty, your stumbling doesn't define you. And you need to know that this morning. Because you know what? If we let that run too much in our quiet time and we isolate ourselves and we just feel like we're just not worthy, it snowballs out of control. If you realize that it's going to happen at times, you brush yourself off, you go back to the Lord, and you say, you know what, Lord, I don't really understand your will here. Sort of like John, Harriet Tubman, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress, Lord. Work with me. Help me. Amen? Amen. What about Peter? <laughs> Peter walked with the Lord from some three, three and a half years, sees the dead raised, sees everything catch a fish he's walking on jesus is walking on water peter walks on water for a few steps because he believes in jesus you know imagine what that was like this is impossible and then when they arrest jesus somebody says oh peter you look familiar you were with him you're a galilean your speech betrays you three times he denies the lord to the point where he's apoplectic he's Calling down, I don't know, it says he was swearing. God knows what he was saying. The old fisherman was coming back, you know, right? World was it deadliest catch. Those guys are rough dudes, man. They have a rough job. But Jesus weeps bitterly when he sees that Jesus is looking at him. And he has a huge failure that's been in the scripture for 2,000 years. But what does he do? He comes back. And you know what? When I think about Peter, I think about that and I say, well, there's hope for me, you know, because I've screwed up before and I'll screw up again. <laughs> but that's the beauty about the Lord, right? I, as a, a young lady who's going through something that Heather and I have been counseling and she, is so, she was so cute. She just said real young and she goes, I just don't want God to be mad at me. I said, you know what? You're doing everything you could possibly do. Don't look at your situation as a reflection of whether God loves you or not. You're making a false e equa equation. She felt better after our discussion. But um, it was, you know, it's some people have a heart for God and some people just don't care, right? But Jesus' assessment, what do people, what are the expectations of John, right? The crowd it was interesting. He said, did you, when you went to go see John out in the wilderness, did you expect to see a reed shaken by the wind? Have you ever seen those reeds? They kind of grow in wet areas and they're, they're so flimsy. You know, they, when the wind blows, they all blow in the same direction. The wind blows the other way, they all go the other direction. And Jesus was saying, That's, that wasn't John. It's not John now. It doesn't define John. John wasn't a pushover. He wasn't a politician. He wasn't a compromiser. No, but the sum total of John's entire ministry was powerful. The small crisis of faith that you have experienced and have heard and overheard didn't, doesn't define John. B, he asked them, what did you go to see when you went to see John? And some people were taken aback by the camel hair and the, I, I, I raised bees, so honey is awesome. Um, the, the locusts, maybe if they're fried, they're probably good, but... You know, they see John's like a wild man out there. And maybe they expected to see a politician. Maybe they expected to see something different. And he says, those clothed in soft garments, gorgeously apparelled, they're in king's courts and castles. They're pampered. They're the elitists. You know, they're, they're famous. They're pampered. They're super wealthy. And I got to tell you something. We're starting to see in our own world in our own country, we're starting to see religious leaders who become politicians. They just start, you know, even some that start out good preaching the truth and they start hanging with, you know, monarchs and this and that. And it's good if you're trying to give them the gospel. But the more I, my, and I've done character studies, the more they hang with these, um, the who's who of the world, they start to lose the whole Jesus is the only way. You know, that starts to kind of slip away. And they just start saying things that tickle your ears. You know, I, I've seen it, this, this current pope, um, he's a very political figure. I know a lot of Catholic people who are not happy with him. We've re, I've read articles about the Southern Baptist Convention. There's a war going on there. And in our own movement, on the higher echelons, we have problems too. I don't mind saying that. We're not going to do that in this church. 
but I don't know, men, women, I guess they, their clothes become nicer, their cars become nicer, their homes, and they become political figures. And Jesus is like, no, that's not, that, that wasn't John, and that wasn't Jesus either. So the prophets didn't have an easy road if they were telling the truth. Everybody loves Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He ministers to me. He was thrown in a dry cistern to die by the king because he told the king things the king didn't want to hear. Right? And you know who saved them? The Babylonians. The, it's a bizarro world, right? They come in and they're like, oh, one of the prophets is in a cistern. What are you doing down there? I told the king that you guys were going to get over the wall. Oh, that's interesting. Hey, come up here. Let's talk a little bit, you know? Daniel, Jeremiah, what did they do? They ministered to the enemy to try to save them too because their own people were totally gave up on God. So, well, let's try somebody else. Let's try the foreigners. Maybe they'll listen. Pretty wild stuff. Uh, truth is stranger than fiction, right? You've heard the expression. Jesus said, what did you go out to see? Even today, people have their beliefs about what ministry should look like. And I hear it sometimes. Oh, this person has, uh, you know, 50,000 people, this person has a million viewers, great. What are they saying? Are you scrutinizing what they're saying? Are you comparing it with Scripture? Right? Is it biblical? Is it sacrificial? Right? Listen, we, what we do here, life still happens. My, my, I don't have a bubble around me. You know, we still struggle with things and just stuff you guys struggle with too. Health, finances, stuff with kids, and uh, life happens, and you still do it. You don't quit. Right? You still stay in there if God has called you to do it. You just keep serving the Lord. You never stop serving the Lord. Verse 27. So Jesus is quoting the Old Testament prophet Malachi 3.1. Behold, I send my messenger. We also find that uh, Luke confirms uh, through Zacharias that John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But Jesus says some great things about John. Why was he the greatest prophet among women? Of course, not including Jesus, but in that category, because the other prophets prophesied about Jesus. They did, and they were awesome, and they were great. However, John had three things that the other prophets didn't have. Number one, one of the prophets prophesied of the prophet John the Baptist. That didn't happen before. Uh, John prepared the way for the Messiah, and John also introduced the Messiah to the culture. Those three things were powerful. It's all about God the Son, isn't it? It, go, it goes to show you how important that is. Verse 28, he says, but the least person in the kingdom of, in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So that one I have to decipher because there's kind of two, I'm sort of 50-50 with these two explanations. Some of you will be like, oh, it's, it seems simple, but you know, to me I have to kind of go through every nook and cranny what is he referring to? Who are these people in the kingdom of God that are greater than John the Baptist? Choice A is that John was part of the old dispensation. He was part of the, you know, the law and, and all that. This, John was ushering in by introducing Jesus. John wasn't ushering in, but he was you know, telling everybody what Jesus would do. Jesus came in the age of grace, new dispensation, um, the age of the Holy Spirit being sealed in believers, the privileges of having a close relationship with the Lord. So some believe that what he meant was that when that transition happens fully into the age of grace, there's, there's greater privileges and there's um, greater closeness to God. B, the other possibility, and if you have C, you can tell me after service. <laughs> if it's really good, I'll bring it up next Sunday. Uh, another possibility is that He's referring to those that literally died and when, you know, when Christ comes and he dies and people who die and they go to be with the Lord is that they're perfected. They're not subject to sin or imperfection. So anyone who's passed on and is, is, ends up being with God in their perfected state is certainly better than anybody who's still alive at that time. You can, I'm not married to either one of them. Verse 29 through 30, it says that the tax collectors justified God, but the Pharisees and the lawyers, understand that the Pharisees were an echelon of religious leaders, and the lawyers were, you know, sort of like our lawyers today, but they were so trained in the Old Testament. 
They could um, decipher cases. They could, uh, if a case was argued and two laws came into conflict, right? They, so they were really part of the religious system, but they were lawyers. They took the law, studied it, um, you know, worked it through and all that kind of thing. They rejected the will of God. Imagine that, somebody who knows the law so well, God's word, rejects the will of God. But again, can't this happen in religion? Somebody who's in religion for a long time and they just become used to the system and they start to, I don't know, whatever, it was a movie, but left behind movie, the, the girl's left behind, she finds a church, goes in there, everyone's gone except for the pastor. And she says, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, and he goes, I could teach it, but I didn't believe it. Pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? God knows the heart. Do we love the Lord? Do we want to spend time with the Lord? Do we want to be with the Lord forever? Or are we, well, my family did this. Well, I like this denomination. I don't know. It's a cool church. Pastor Joseph's funny things from the pulpit. Those are not the good reasons. The good reason is a relationship with Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end, at the end of service. So they rejected the will of God, but the common person longed for God. They longed for God. Uh, I'm just going to leave you with this one last point, and then I'll, I'll move to the last section, is that I know Pastor Vinny has done this a lot. Um, he's, if, if, you, if you've never seen uh, the World Economic Forum and some of these, they're elites, they're globalists, they're billionaires, they've bought off some of our politicians, unfortunately. They're doing that in a lot of countries. And you hear them talk, and it's caustic. You know, they basically, they can have the jet planes, they can do whatever they want, but everybody else on the planet needs to live less, they need to spend more for food and gas. They're really, it's really demented. Um, transhumanism, hacking the genome and making us a hybrid race. These people are whacked and they have a lot of power. Let's put that aside. They routinely mock God, routinely, but then they say that there's no God. Okay. So if a, a religion started tomorrow and it was the Easter Bunny religion and there was a million followers, I'd be like, yeah, it's, you really don't want to put your faith in the Easter Bunny. He's not real. So I don't even know why I'm saying he because he doesn't exist. In the World Economic Forum, if you listen to these people, watch their videos. Don't take it from me. They have a visceral hatred for God, the way they speak about him. I'm not going to speak about the Easter Bunny because he doesn't exist. That's called mental illness, right? So they tell you that God doesn't exist and they tell you about what God did and his creation and how we're going to change things and take this away from God. These people are messed up. There's a visceral, vitriolic hatred for God. Okay? So the point I'm trying to make is that I don't care what title anybody has. It doesn't matter. Right? Is that God knows everyone's heart. And, and I hate to say it, comfort and wealth and especially now people are panicking i'm paying more for food <laughs> my grocery bill is just as high as yours my electric bill you know so uh i'm always playing with the thermostat <laughs> trying to save some money but the thing is the the allure of comfort protection security this is why jesus said it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. And it's not that he doesn't like rich people. He loves rich people. There's a lot of great rich people. But it's that, there, that allure of comfort and security and safety is, becomes a God in itself. What do I need God for? I got all my needs taken care of. So, listen, this happened 2,000 years ago. It's playing out today as we speak. Last few verses, verse 31. It says, And the Lord said, To then... To what then shall I liken the men of this generation or culture? And what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We mourned to you and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber or an excessive drinker a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You see truth mixed in with lies. He was a friend of the downtrodden and the sinners, but he wasn't a drunkard and a, and a glutton. Um, but wisdom is justified by all her children. So three out of three is John's disingenuous, or John's generation's disingenuous struggle. So in other words, 
uh, his generation, including the religious people. Now, don't get me wrong, nobody's a monolith. We should never stereotype, right? We're always taught that. There were some religious people who actually, you see it through Acts, you see it through the Gospels, that they came to Jesus kind of privately and they accepted and believed in him. So there was a lot of really good religious people who were looking for being closer to God. But as a whole, many of them um, didn't want their power structure, right? We keep talking about this, their comfort zone. They didn't want that knocked down. Jesus was gaining a following and they were losing that following because Jesus was genuine, they weren't. So when we look at this, we see the culture, the religious system, they were disingenuous. They were fickle and feckless about God. And here's the illustration Jesus used, which we'll close with, is children in the marketplace. So back in those days, you would go to market and you'd buy, not like the supermarket, quick checkout and all that stuff. It took a while, you're in the marketplace. Um, you're, if your kids would come right to, with you in a marketplace as you're negotiating, and you, they would negotiate prices. That'd be great if we could do that in the supermarket. Uh, <laughs> and the kids would find things to amuse themselves. So they would play these little games. You know, uh, some were more upbeat. We played the flute. Oh, but you didn't dance. We mourned. It's a funeral. It's somber, right? Um, you know, so what he's trying to do is kind of show these two illustrations. So the first one is, is the upbeat one. They, they play the flute, and the other ones, they don't want to dance to it. The flute was a depiction of Jesus, his ministry. Jesus, uh, joy, fun, wow. Look at this great miracle. Wow, hungry people are being fed. That's exciting and that's fun. If you're really doing it right, being a part of God's work is fun, right? Ask the, the Food for the Soul people about what they do. Isn't it great seeing somebody come in? Or it's like these smiles already. They come into this building and they get free groceries and they're indigent. It's so exciting to And they're children. It's great. So Jesus' ministry was fun, but the culture and the religious system didn't like that because Jesus was having too much fun, <laughs> and his followers were having too much fun. So they said things that were untrue about him. The next type of entertainment was more, uh, it was a mourning, it was a dirge, but the others didn't weep. So the mourning was a depiction, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, of John the Baptist, more reserved, you know, John was probably a great guy, but he was more serious. He was more stern. And the response was, oh, he has a demon. What's wrong with him? Why is he so fiery? I like that. I like what fiery, you know, it's fiery is cool. But they didn't like that. So the culture didn't like the celebratory, but they also didn't like the somber. somber. So what, what happens? You can't make these people happy, right? They wanted to make ministry in their own image. They were looking for a smorgasbord faith. But... Do we not see the same thing today? There's some people that you just can't please. They go from church to church to church to church. Now, if they're not teaching the Bible, I understand not staying, but they just have a complaint about everything. How the church looks, you know, uh, the personalities, the this, the that. It's like you go to church to fellowship with people, to, um, to pray, to take partake of communion, to understand the Word of God but there's just some people that you just can't make them happy. And don't we live in that culture today, right? I try to talk to people when I witness to them and they don't know the Lord yet. And I'm like, listen, there's, there's another alternative out there that you haven't explored. Just give me a few minutes. Let me talk about it because you're obviously not happy. <laughs> you know, you ever meet somebody, it's just they're just constantly negative. There's a psychological study that came out which reinforced other psychological studies about why the media, which is controlled by corporations, are always putting out bad news. They rarely talk about the good things that police do or the in, in good things in politics or you know just good things that are happening in the culture. People are working with each other. You see them once in a while, but it's mostly it's monkeypox. Now the sharks are going to eat you. Don't go in the water. And, oh, it just doesn't end. And... <laughs> It's a, it's a psychological condition where, so if you're, not, if you're not in the spirit and you're in the flesh, our, the organism, we were designed right, with a sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, fight or flight or freeze kind of response, and watching the media for hours, it's like you can't take yourself away from the television, and the reason is because there's something in the organism, right? If you're not doing something better or positive or going outside, is that 
the organism needs to see what dangers are out there so it could protect itself. It's a very base, animalistic type of, and I, I tell people, turn that television off. Um, so, so that's why they do that, and the more people they can get glued to the TV, the more money they make because they're run by corporations. So there you have it in a nutshell. I don't even know why I brought that up. Oh, the culture. All right, last part. Verse 35, Jesus said, but wisdom is justified by all her children. Another statement that's interesting, uh, you could say that eventually the truth will come out. The wise is proven wise by their actions. Um, actions speak louder than words. So Jesus had a lot of these pithy, enigmatic toward a, sort of things that he put in his preachings that you, you kind of, you stop and say, what does that mean? But it's fascinating because it's very deep. It's very deep. And Jesus was basically saying, listen, you'll see. You'll see the fruits of this. The fruits of those that have rejected the way of salvation, but you'll also see the fruits of what John did, what he started, even though he's having a hard time right now, give, cut him some slack, where Jesus is, what he started, and what he finished, and what he promised, and what he did on the cross. So wisdom is justified by all of her children. So let me go back to the sermon title, Struggling with God's Will. John the Baptist struggled with God's will. Famous people in history struggle with God's will. You may be right now, or you will be, or you have struggled with God's will. Do not equate that with God's forgotten about you, he doesn't love you, all those other Christians in the church have a perfect life but me. None of those things are true. And you know what Jesus did? He affirmed John. And I'll paraphrase, as he's speaking to the onlookers, I got John's back, he's a good man. Yeah, this is a major, major crisis of faith, but that's not how I and the Father see John. And brothers and sisters, you're going through something right now. It means that you're human, and God sees you the same way. He has not lost one iota of love for you because you're struggling, and you need to know that. And I'm sure there's about 20 people or more in this church right now in addition to those watching that are going through that. So I want you to be encouraged by it because we're in good company. Amen? Amen? The best thing for us to do is to not listen to the voices that we're not loved, not listen to the voices that we're forgotten about, to continue to pray to God and even say to God in prayer, Lord, I don't understand. You know how many times I've said that in prayer? And I'm your pastor. I go off for a walk, I go for a drive, there's nobody around, I'm like, Lord, I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, you, you got me 85% of the way, I'm, I figured all that, I can't get the last 15%. And the Lord is just saying, trust me, follow me, amen? And you know what, when we witness to other people, the fact that we show ourselves to be human to other people is something that breaks the ice. You know, sometimes, I don't, know, I don't understand this, and I've seen this in, in small places, aggregately, that Christians think they have to go out there and put on this plastic face and pretend. You're not going to reach anybody that way because nobody else is, that has a perfect life or acts like that. Just be human. Just say, you know, I got my struggles too. Yeah, I'm dealing with this too. So I want to encourage you with that, struggling with God's will, and I really hope that um, there's a bunch of people who go home today and just feel refreshed by that. Get, get back on the horse, so to speak. Get close to the Lord because that's the best place to be. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you know all things. You're so awesome, Lord. I love the fact, Lord, that you record failures of some of the greatest people that ever lived because it shows that there's hope for us. I just pray if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Maybe they grew up in a church. Maybe they 